Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Bars. I'm Manson Musa. As of 2022, there was an estimated 145,602 people sentenced under the federal jurisdiction for a number of so-called offenses. On April 27, 2023, the United States Sentence Commission submitted to Congress amendments to the federal sentencing guidelines that would recommend lower sentences for certain defendants, including those with so-called point status. The commission is considering applying these changes retroactively, meaning incarcerated people whose sentence would be lower today may be eligible for a sentencing reduction. Around 18,775 people might be eligible for a sentence reduction, and of those, an estimated 3,288 people would be immediately uh -huh. eligible for release. Here to talk about this is Murray Price, General Counsel for Families Against Mandatory Minimum. Welcome, Murray. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you. And I'm I'll so glad you're, you and your audience are interested in this topic. Okay, and, and as we should be. First, tell our audience a little about yourself and uh, what the organization that you're working for so we can get them to see just how you, you wind up in this space. Absolutely. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I am the general counsel of FAM, and uh, in that uh, role at FAM, I work on a number of different things, including the uh, federal sentencing guidelines that you described earlier. FAM is an organization of currently and formerly incarcerated people uh, and many others who have joined together to urge sentencing and corrections reform in both the Federal Bureau of Prisons and the federal system, as well as in states. So we work to lift up the voices of people who have been touched by or affected by the criminal legal system uh, so that they can advocate for reform. Now, you know, FAM believes really strongly in the power of storytelling, um, bringing the actual impact of the laws and the policies that our lawmakers pass to their attention so that the lawmakers can uh, reconsider their positions and perhaps change uh, their trajectory. Um, so that's a very important aspect to us. And so we are very proud of the work that we do um, with all of our members. All right, so now the we let's let's start going down the road of what we're looking at and what fam is trying to get done okay mm -hmm. so we have the uh the sentencing commission the federal sentencing commission is responsible for uh developing the sentencing guidelines for anyone up under federal jurisdiction am i correct that's correct so the okay. sentencing commission writes the guidelines that govern sentences um, below, between, and above the mandatory minimum sentences. That's correct. Okay, so now, and they, they came into it, they, they are mandated by Congress to do it, and, and they have the for, and it has the force of law. Uh, whatever recommendations they make has the force of law, am I correct? Um, to some extent. Um, originally, explain, explain the difference. Yes, of course. Originally, so mandatory minimums, um, judges, except in a very few circumstances, cannot avoid imposing a mandatory minimum if it applies to a certain conviction. And for many years, that was also the case with the sentencing guidelines. Um, the sentencing guidelines um, became advisory uh, a number of years ago following a decision in the Supreme Court called Booker. And I won't go into all the details, but right. what it means is that judges have a lot more flexibility with the guidelines than they do with the mandatory minimums, and they're able to depart from those guidelines, and more importantly, uh, to vary, to sort of find a, a better place to rest a sentence if the imposed sentence is either, uh, excuse me, if the calculated guideline is either too long or too short. And generally, judges sentence uh, in many cases below those guidelines because they can be very strict. Right. Okay. So now we're we're at the juncture now where the sentencing commission is recommending a change in the sentencing guidelines. Okay. Walk us through the changes that they're recommending, and then walk us through how everybody is going to be affected by the variations, like the point system. Exactly. Okay. So um, it's a little bit complicated, but you can think of the sentencing guidelines as a great big grid with forty-three 
boxes this way and mm -hmm. six boxes this way. Right. You see. Um, the, those boxes that go across the top are uh, criminal history points. Mm -hmm. How many points, and there's a system within the guidelines that says you've been arrested fairly recently right. or you had three prior convictions or right. there's a variety, lots of complicated rules, but it'll put you somewhere in that box. And as you go over on the box, your sentence gets higher and higher and higher, the recommended right. guideline sentence. Right. Okay. So with this change, the U.S. Sentencing Commission took a look at some of those criminal history rules, and they decided to, going forward, lower the impact of two of them. Now, those two have to do with what are called status points. So that's when an individual is convicted of a crime um, while serving a sentence, another sentence. So for example, being incarcerated or being on probation or being on supervised release. If any of those things happened, it used to add points going across the top right, to make right. the sentence greater. Um, and those status points were found not to have any impact on one's, or very little impact on one's recidivism. In other words, um, adding status points didn't do anything to make our community safer because it somehow kept people incarcerated longer um, right, and right, right. not able to reoffend. Um, the other proposal that the commission has is to reduce um, uh, sentences for people who have zero criminal history points. Right, right. Now, right now, that first box going across the top, that very first one is for people who have either zero or one criminal right. history point. And it's going to take that zero out, essentially, for a number of people, not everyone. Um, but it is going to lessen the impact of that additional um, criminal, you know, putting you in that criminal history box. Right. And so and what happens is from what you from what you explained to our audience is because you have a, a arbitrary system where in terms of like like you were saying, like, OK, you're giving me points for uh, it to increase my sentence based on my prior. And if I didn't have a prior, but I'm going to be put in the category of having a prior or the effect of having a prior, that's automatically going to increase my sentence, regardless so, so. of the, regardless of the and 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 I want to, and I'm going to get into this part of the conversation, regardless of what I did, regardless of what I did coming in the door, regardless of what I did at this juncture, because of this point system, because of this sentencing mechanism, all everything is on the table. Uh, I was locked up before. I had priors. I have I, I, I've been in and out of the system. Therefore, regardless of what I'm doing right here, what I'm here for right now, the sentencing mechanism is going to say it ain't what you're here for now. It's what you did in the past. Am I correct? Well, it's a combination. So, okay. Explain. yeah, it is a combination. So your your uh, guideline for the offense that one is convicted of right now is handled on on this axis. Remember, I told you there was an right, axis right, like right. this with the 43 and then with the. So on this axis, um, there's a number of factors, including sort of the nature of the crime of conviction, mm -hmm. whether there were victims, was there a gun, was mm -hmm. there a large amount of loss, right. if you it was a fraud, all kinds of things will you'll 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 set somewhere based on the nature of your conviction, but then you can go up or you can go down based on some of those characteristics. So you may have a mitigating um, factor that will reduce that sentence. But anyway, you get to that point. Um, and so that's the sort of current, right, offense. And then the history, if you have criminal history, that's going to move you over and that's going to increase your points as well, or your, right. your uh, guideline sentence rather as well. Right. And I think that's what I, I'm trying to get our audience to understand is that on the front end, and I agree, I understand what you're saying, that they want to take into account what the offense is. So if it's a victimless offense, if it's a property crime, if nobody was harmed, uh, it's, then I'm going to get factored in that. But then if I have a history, criminal history, regardless of, if I, regardless of what I did here, it's going to be impacted by my criminal history. And, That's exactly and, correct. Right. Mm -hmm. and so there and, and therein lies the problem. So 
how do so with this with these changes, a person in that situation in in the situation I just described, I got a property crime, no victim, nobody was harmed. Uh, that's the it might be a, a series of mitigators, right? Under that's the right. new under this new system, how would that play out? Right. So if you were uh, if that um, if you were convicted of that crime when you were serving another sentence, and by that I mean not just if you were incarcerated, but let's right. say you're on probation. You know, you've right. been released released and you're on probation. Um, and then you are convicted of this crime. They take the fact that you're on probation and add points. They're called status points. Right. So the status of being right convicted of something else, um, or of serving or or of committing this offense while serving that right, probation right, is going right. to add points. And right. they're basically, um, you know, uh, going to to lower that. So right now you get two additional criminal history points, which could move you over into new criminal history categories um, for having status points. But they're gonna they're gonna um they're gonna change that so that only people um who receive seven or more criminal history points anyway, right, without the status points, and um who committed the incident offense while under any criminal justice sentence will only get one point as opposed to two added. To okay. their so there's that's one limitation that's going to take some time off of people's sentences. Mm -hmm. and, okay, so in in terms of application, say for example, I come in and in my in my offense. So this is for education of a, of the public, so they understand why uh, y'all are asking for support in this regard. Because sure. somehow some people might think, well, you know, you don't if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. And, and therefore, the time that you get for the crime, regardless of how they cut it up, is time for a crime that you committed. So, mm -hmm. in terms of, but I, I, getting people to understand this, so I come, I, I come in, I'm on, I'm on, uh, I get locked up. I, I'm on five years probation. I got three years. I got t two years left for my probation, and I get, a, I get an offense. And the offense I get is a prop is a, is a, like I said. It's a property crime, no victim, no weapon. All right. How would that play out in terms of this new change? These change. For, take it, first take it, if I don't get a change versus if I do get a change. If, if you, know, you follow me on that? I, I do, but it's impossible to do that calculation. Okay. Number one, in my head, but number two, I'd really need to sit down and understand where the right. sentence is and things right. like that. But right now, what it means is that you have to you can have up to, you can have a fair amount of criminal history up to seven points. And if you don't have those seven points, then, um, you know, that being on status is only get you um, the one, right? Um, but I can't, it's, it's hard to sort of do the, to do right. the, um, the calculation. Okay, okay. So I, understand, have, I understand, I understand. I, and, I'm, and I'm really, the reason why I'm trying to get the simplification of it, because I'm trying to get, I, I understand the system, because yeah. I, I went through it. Yeah. But I'm trying to educate our audience on understanding yeah. that the, the, the changes yeah. that we're, that you're asking are humane changes in terms oh, of yes. people, you know, you serve in time, you serve your sentence, and and in serving your sentence uh, or, being, or being given a sentence give you hope on having a future in terms of getting out versus not having no hope because of prior history or bad decision making or none of the above but the fact that you find yourself back in this space and now because of your prior history your your initial sentence is going to be augmented by a number of factors that you don't have no control over and it's going to create you doing serving a person or him or her serving a lot more time if these things didn't exist. So that's really what I was trying to get to understand. But walk us through okay. what it is y'all I'll just add one thing. I, I misspoke a little bit. You don't get any status points unless you have 
seven criminal history points and you've committed this the instant offense um, right. while on this, under supervision. I mean, that's just, I think the Sentencing Commission found that unfair. And I think that that's what you're driving at, that this right. was something that was really unfair to people and it was unfairly inflating the sentence. And it wasn't helping us do anything with respect to reducing recidivism. It didn't have any impact. Right. And, and, that, and that's, I think that was in that, in, 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 in their, the goal of this draconian system was to, you know, even though uh, misinformation or, or misapplication was to reduce recidivism, I think that's, that was the goal of the sentencing mechanism, like to try to stop people from coming back. But that's another conversation in and of itself. But talk, tell our audience about what it is, what it is y'all trying to, what is FAM trying to get done? Explain well, to our audience what FAM is trying to get done. Well, let me let me just go back and explain a little something. So these two changes, both to um, uh, status points and um, and also uh, first offender, that's going to have an impact on reducing sentences for people going forward. Okay, so if that gets um, the sentencing commission sent all of the amendments, all of the amendments, including these criminal history amendments, to Congress at the end of April, as you pointed out earlier. They're going to sit with Congress until November 1st. So there's a waiting period. And if Congress wants to change anything, it has to pass a bill in both houses and has to be signed by the president to either disapprove any of these amendments or modify them. Now, we don't think anything's going to happen with respect to criminal history changes that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But here's the other thing. While we're waiting, while the commission is waiting, it took a look and it has... Um, the statutory duty to explore whether a change that it makes that would lower a sentence going forward uh, should be applied retroactively, right. right? So in other words, what that means is, would uh, if the Sentencing Commission were to declare these changes retroactive, um, it means that people who are currently incarcerated who meet the criteria that's going forward, but they right. would meet the criteria if they were sentenced today, they get to go back to the sentencing court and ask the sentencing court to apply those changes retroactively. Right. Right. Um, so, and I think you mentioned some numbers earlier about just the numbers of people that would be affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's, that is um, a change that we think is super important and should be supported. And when the Sentencing Commission makes a change like this, it always has to do a thing called notice and comment. It has to it has to publish the fact that it's doing this, right? And then it has to, you know, it wants to do this rather. And then it has to, uh, it asks the public to comment on it. Um, and what we always do at FAM is to try and encourage everybody, people who are incarcerated, people on the outside, loved ones, everyone, to comment, to tell the commission, yes, this is the right thing to do. Okay. Right, because they haven't decided to do it yet. There's a lot of considerations. Is it going to be a lot of work? Are there going to be is the is the magnitude going to be very great? Is the difference in the sentence that people are serving now and the one they'll get after this enough to justify making it retroactive? So they're asking all those questions, and so what they want to hear from the public is you know thumbs up or thumbs down and why, right? And so you know we sent a note around, which I think you saw. Um, mm -hmm. saying, we hope that you'll comment on this, right? And we send it both to our, our members, um, uh, you know, loved ones on the outside, but also through our core link system, the federal, uh, to our federally uh, incarcerated members on, on the inside. Okay, so, and, and why, why, why? Okay, so you say, if they change it, what, what would be the answer? What would be, what should be our, our, the people's answer? Like, why, why should they change it? Why should they change it? Right? Why should they make it retroactive? Why should they've they make decided, it? They've already decided to make it because, well, it, in my view, I think that if you determine that a system is unjust, um, and you're going to end that system, um, the, you know, so for example, all this criminal history points that we're talking about turns out to be unjust or unwarranted, and we're going to end that. Um, there's no reason not to go back and apply that to the people who are who are serving sentences that are now unjust or unwarranted, right? So it's a little bit of just common sense and a little bit also of common justice. Right. Like we have looked at the experience of people who are serving these sentences that are longer because of these criminal history points that we're gonna get rid of. 
and we've decided based on their experience that that's too much and we're going to take it out, then um, it only ma- it, it, it's it's the only the right thing to do go is to go back and make sure that everybody who is sentenced under those systems gets an opportunity to make their case. It's not a get out of jail free card. Not everybody's going to get out. The judge gets to decide on a case by case and individualized basis. And they have to look at public safety. They have to look at all the sentencing factors before they can say, yes, I'm going to apply this change and lower your sentence accordingly. And Lisa, I think in in in, in regards to the advocacy of the fam's advocacy, mm-hmm. it gives it gives the uh, the prison population, mainly those sentenced under federal prison guideline, it gives them some hope because a, a lot of them are not their sentences was enhanced by virtue of you know the criminal history. Their sentence was in, in, oh. impacted by a, a lot of the draconian uh, status points that they interjected. So in that regard, it gives them hope. And when you got a system where it's overcrowded as it is, uh, it's resources are, are are not being afforded individuals in the system in terms of their ability to like do some things to progress. It gives a person the hope to say, well, okay, I'm on. I'm you know, I can do right. I can focus on getting out. Because I can see light at the end of the tunnel, so I think that's that's one of the things. Tell tell our audience uh, going forward, outside, is there anything else you need we need to know going forward, other than what you're saying as far as the, and, and your advocacy? Sure. I, the one point I want to make that the sentencing commission revealed to us is, and you will not be surprised, there is um, a racial disparity aspect to this history point counting as well. There's going to be 11,500 people who would get a lower guideline today because of status points, right? And of those, 43% of them are black. Um, so it's a big number. And then if the uh, amendment was made retroactive, um, you know, a little over 2,000 people would be eligible for immediate release. And then similarly, if that zero point offender guideline was made retroactive, um, that would affect almost 70% of the people who were sentenced um, based on those zero points who would get a lower sentence a day are Hispanic. So, you know, I, I, it never surprises me. I mean, the numbers are rather large and it doesn't entirely surprise me that this is the case. But um, it is also, um, I hope, some small advance for racial justice in the system as well. And I, and I, and I recall... Uh looking at a report where they talked about the the, uh, the yeah. racial disparity and in this in this mechanism and how this and and the fact that it automatically created a, a situation where uh black and brown skinned people and, and and basically poor people in general would be heavily impacted upon by and which automatically opened the door for uh the conversation of why why are you using it what's the purpose behind it but going forward, uh, you say, what is it that you want us to do going forward? Well, what we'd love to, to do, do going, going forward. Right. Going forward, um, between now and June 23rd, that comment period is going to be open. Um, and we sent out a um, sample letter that people can, can send to the Sentencing Commission. Um, you can find that at our website at www.fam.com. F-A-M-M dot O-R-G. Um, and I can also send you a link to um, publish on your show. Uh, and that just explains a little bit about this uh, change and why it's so important and asks people to write a letter to the commission and encourage them to make this change retroactive. So that's the thing I, w- I hope that, um, that all of you will be able to do uh, once you've uh, finished watching the show. There you again, have it. The, the deadline is June 23rd. There you have it, the real news, June 23rd. We're asking everyone to review this information and make a determination. If you have a family member that's locked up in the federal system, it's a, it may make a big difference between the information they use to enhance their sentence versus uh, that information no longer being used. And you might look them and have your loved one home by Christmas, by Thanksgivings, or some of the more memorial or memorable opportunities. Uh, we ask that you continue to look at these things and evaluate them in the context that they're being offered. Thank you, Murray, for uh, 
in educating us and educating our audience on the importance of this. Thank you for having me on, and um, thanks for the wonderful questions, and I appreciate your, your participation in this project. And we ask you to continue to support the real news and rallying the bars. Murray, uh, Pierce, and, and FAM has been around for a long time, but you, you don't hear about these this individual or these groups on NBC or, or your major news networks. You only hear about them on uh, the real news, and you only get an opportunity to really see, hear the impact of them when you start rattling the bars, when they come on and rattle the bars about the sentencing structure, the sentencing guidelines, and the impact it's having on mass incarceration. You, we're talking about dismantling the prison industrial complex. Well, it starts with one shovel at a time, and here's a shovel that's being offered by FAM. Thank you. And continue to support rattling the bars. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.